Okay, continuing on in chapter four of how to read the Bible for all it's worth, we're gonna begin with slide number 28, um, talking about what makes something a matter of indifference. Again, a matter of indifference or is something like a gray area, okay? Throw in, again, some of these controversial issues. Should, can a Christian drink? Should a Christian drink? Tattoos, piercings, movies, R-rated movies, okay? Uh, d different things that, that, again, are, the Bible doesn't specifically say um, to do something or not to do something. It gives us hints, it gives us clues, but again, these are called gray areas or matters of indifference. They give the example of, of food, drink, the observance of days. Again, th think it through. Some Christians work on Sundays, all right? So, um, and they have no choice, okay, because of their station in life or whatever. To not work would be to dereliction of duty for their families. So does that mean that they're violating the Sabbath every time that they're working on Sundays? Uh, does that mean that they violate the Sabbath by going to a church service on a Saturday evening or a Friday night, okay? In other words, these are some of these matters of, of indifference. Um, you know, Jesus said that uh, the Sabbath was made for man. Man is not made for the Sabbath. Okay, so, so let's talk about some of this a little bit here. If you, again, on slide 28, matters of indifference are not inherently moral, but they are cultural. Again, remember what I said um, a few videos ago, where, where in America, where um, culturally we still have remnants of the holiness movement uh, that, that affects Christianity, okay? Um, alcoholism is generally, or, or drinking, um, is looked at as something that is problematic, okay? Now, again, it's less so because in my personal opinion, Christians are becoming far too permissive and far too uh, self-indulgent to really allow some of the biblical admonitions about drinking to actually apply to their lives, but that's beside the point, okay? Um, take America, again, that is more eh, about drinking, in Christianity, but then, then go to Europe, go to England, okay? Again, I experienced that firsthand in England where, where uh, it was not unusual to see a pastor, to see a, a missionary after a service go out for a drink, okay? We would look at it aghast like, oh my gosh, what are you doing, okay? That's a cultural difference that you've got to recognize that you bring to the table when you read scriptural um uh, admonitions or warnings about drinking, okay? You've got to realize that you're bringing that cultural baggage to your interpretation of scripture. We all do it. None of us is exempt, okay? Um, unless you've really done, you know, you're really good at hermeneutics, okay? Then you begin to realize these things, and that's why we're having this discussion and having this class, okay? So matters of indifference are not inherently moral, but they're cultural, even if they stem from religious culture. Again, I already established that. Matters that tend to differ from culture to culture, even among genuine believers, may usually be considered matters of indifference. Again, wine or non-wine cultures, okay? Drinking or non-drinking cultures. I mean, you go over to Germany and, Ober das Vera, right? Come on, kann man immer sprechen? Let's have some beer, right? Um, even among Christians. Um, it's different there, okay? Uh, it's especially important to note, and to me this is where the rubber meets the road, it's, it's especially important to note that the sin lists in the epistles, okay, Romans 1, 29 through 30, 1 Corinthians 5, 11, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 4, never include first century equivalents of the items we have listed above. Again, the sin list, what actually counts as a sin, okay, as opposed to some cultural matter of indifference, okay? Um, sin lists never include first century equivalents, okay? In other words, they are moral issues that are transcultural, they're transhistorical, they apply in every culture and every time frame of human history, okay? Moreover, such matters of indifference are never included among the various sin lists of Christian imperatives. Again, Romans 12, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, again, You've got to learn to make a distinction between what is a cultural issue that was cultural in the first century, it's cultural for us, 
and then learn to understand what is a moral issue. Again, moral issues in the Bible. A great example is homosexuality, okay? That is morally wrong. It was morally wrong in the Old Testament. If you see it in Leviticus 18, um, you see it in Leviticus 20, okay? Um, you, you see examples of that in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians um, you know, uh, chapter 6. Um, in, in, in 2 Timothy and in, in different scriptures that, that talk about that. Uh, Romans chapter 1, again, you know, look at 27 through 30 or so. You know, in other words, it's really clear through the panorama of scripture that, there, that homosexual behavior is morally problematic despite what attempts are made in our current culture today in 2020, despite the Obergefell decision in 2015, doesn't matter what the world says, doesn't matter what your personal opinion says, doesn't matter what your feelings say, what does the scripture say, in particular, if it's a moral issue, okay? Talking about homosexuality, look at Leviticus chapter 18, okay? God doesn't just call it a sin, he calls it an abomination. Equivalent, homosexuality is equivalent to sacrificing your child to Molech, which, which basically warrants the nuclear option by God and that God will vomit the Israelites who practice it out of the land, okay? Everybody out of the pool. That's how bad, how morally problematic homosexual behavior is, despite what people are saying today, okay? Because again, it's not a cultural thing, it's a moral thing. So moral issues, again, they apply, doesn't matter what culture in it you're in, doesn't matter what era you're in, okay? Um, go to uh, slide number 29. Okay, the problem of cultural relativity. Again, this is an area where most present day difficulties and differences lie. It's the place where the problem of God's eternal word, having been given in historical particularity, comes most sharply into focus. Okay, and so we'll talk about this here. If you go to um, slide number 30, the problem of cultural relativity. Okay, the problem has the following steps. First of all, epistles are occasional documents of the first century. Again, they're written based on occasions, based on certain questions that were being posed to particular biblical writers, and then this is their response, okay? Their questions may be entirely different than our questions today. They're conditioned by the language and culture of the first century, which spoke to certain and specific situations in the first century church, okay? Second of all, many of the specific situations in the epistles are so completely conditioned by their first century setting that all recognize that they have little or no personal application as a word for today, except perhaps the most distant sense of ones deriving some principle from them, okay? Again, the, the great example of bringing Paul's cloak from Carpus's house in Troas, okay? Pretty easy to figure out that, yeah, that's that's first century culture, okay? Again, what would be a 21st century com comparable? Um, hey, Pastor Eric has asked that uh, Kim bring his Kindle to this particular small group because he forgot it and left it at the church, okay? That would be a comparable thing, but you know, we're not looking for Paul's cloak, okay? Number three, other passages are also thoroughly conditioned by their first century settings, but the word contained in them may be translated into new but comparable settings. How do you do that? Look for the principle, okay? Is there a general principle that can be applied? Maybe not the specific, but a general principle, okay? Let's just take, let's, let's take tattoos. I'll just pick on tattoos, okay? Probably offending a bunch of people reading this or, or listening to this, but you know, should you get a tattoo? Um, you know, you, you can quote Leviticus, isn't it? Not, is it Leviticus 19.28 where it talks about don't put a t tattoo mark on your body, okay? You can say, well, that was Old Testament and that doesn't apply to today and that was under the Old Testament law and we're under the grace law, we're under grace in Jesus and all that kind of stuff. Yes, that is true. However, the principle remains. What was, what was getting a tattoo a symbol of back in that time in, in the Old Testament? It was a symbol of paganism, okay? The pagans were cutting their bodies. The pagans were doing some form of mutilation to their bodies in reverence to a god or some pagan concept, okay? So it begs the question of you as a Christian in the 21st century who wants to get a tattoo, what's your motive, okay? Is it self-indulgent? Again, 
apply the six or seven qualifications that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 to your desire to get a tattoo. Paul would say, he would, he would come down on the side of, yes, you can. However, consider these six or seven qualifications first. Are you doing it for the glory of God? Does, is it going to offend or harm a, another brother? How is it going to affect your Christian race? You know, walk. You know, you're, you're, the race God's called you to run. Um, how about that tattoo that you have on your forearm uh, five years from now on a job interview in the summer when you've got short sleeves and your boss sees that? Okay. In other words, prudential things you got to think through. Okay. Uh, again, you're free to do it. However, there's qualifications. You need to be mindful of these things as you translate them to today. Again, these I'm trying to give you examples of principles where know the prohibition against. Uh, uh, the prohibition against tattoos in Leviticus, Leviticus 19. Try saying Leviticus many times after you've been doing a bunch of videos. The prohibition against tattoos in Leviticus, um, while it doesn't specifically apply to Christians today under the New Covenant, the principle remains, okay? What does it look like? Okay, well, I don't care what anyone thinks. I'm doing it for me. Well, if it's all about you, that could be problematic too, okay? Again, you're not beholden to other people's opinions, but if it's self-indulgent, well, that's problematic too, okay? God's fine with freedom, but not self-indulgent freedom to the exclusion of, hey, I don't care what even God thinks, I'm doing it anyway, okay? You can, can you see some of these principles I'm trying to show you how to apply? And then uh, number four, uh, is it not possible, therefore, that still other texts, although they appear to have comparable particulars, are also conditioned by the first century setting and need to be translated into new settings or should they be simply left in the first century? Again, um, part of this is common sense, okay? Part of this is fairly obvious. Again, Paul's cloaks um, and, and parchments, that's pretty obvious. That doesn't apply specifically to today. Others are not so much, but some good common sense can help you in these things too. Um, all right, um, I'm gonna stop there and I'll begin with slide number uh, 31 uh, next.